Our next speaker is Matt Long from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, is, that, yep. you, is your mic on? It is. Okay, great. Okay, I'd just like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to pick up where Andreas left off and, and talk a little bit about uh, oxygen in the ocean in the context of, of climate variability as well as climate change. And, and the starting point for this is really sort of the Earth system modeling framework, and in particular, um, our ability now to run very large ensembles of, of an Earth system model. And what I'm illustrating here is some results from a, a previous iteration of the NCAR uh, model. These, this is a paper by, uh, led by Clara, Clara Desser. And the key thing here is just to develop an appreciation for the degree to which internal climate variability exerts large influence on the trajectories over the next several decades. So in this model, we have you know, average um, wintertime trends uh, over, uh, over the, um, the continental United States or over North America here. And, and, and this is sort of a familiar picture of this characteristic signal of climate change. But if we drill down into this large ensemble, we can identify members that are exhibiting very different behavior over the next several decades. For instance, this, this coolest member shows a significant cooling you know, in the central intermountain west that's not represented in this, um, in this average signal. Right? And so the, the implication here is that, is that the combination of forced change and uh, natural variability is really what's going to determine the evolution of the system over the next several decades. And indeed, this has implications. For instance, if you're living in Seattle, you know, and you get this, uh, this ensemble member, life pretty much just marches on as, as it has been, whereas you know, the, the one that exhibits the most warming uh, has, has a pretty radical trend, right? So now we're gonna take this, this sort of perspective and bring it to the ocean and, and, and look at it, the influence in the context of ocean oxygen. So just to recap, Andreas sort of went through these mechanisms. But the way, um, well, that's blurry. Um, the way oxygen works, it's coming into focus. <laughs> okay, so the way oxygen works, right, is that the surface ocean is well ventilated and uh, remains near saturation. Oxygen is entrained in the interior through subduction processes, ventilation, and transported um, isopycnally, where it is consumed via remineralization. Um, this leads to a, a system where the spectrum of variability in the ocean interior is reddened relative to the spectrum of the forcing at the surface. Okay, and we can see that in the context of a climate model. Um, what I'm plotting here is the dominant frequency or, or period of variability of oxygen in the thermocline. And so what we have is an imprint of this reddening process by ventilation in that the extratropical thermocline shows the, a dominant frequency of variability in excess of 10 to 20 years, right? So it's this, it's this pushing of the, of the power spectrum towards decadal timescales um, by the reddening of circulation. So just to recap then, this is the, um, the signal of deoxygenation simulated in um, the community Earth system model. This is the large ensemble that Andreas was referring to. And we'll just really focus on on the, on the red, which is the RCP 8.5 scenario, um, we see this precipitous decline that leads to about, you know, about 3.5% uh, of the total inventory lost by the end of the 21st century, and that's um, tightly coupled to this inexorable rise in ocean temperature. I'd like to just sort of drill into this signal a little bit and look at um, how it manifests uh, in a zonal sense and point out a couple things about the time scales. So the top row here shows, um, shows zonal mean sections of oxygen. This is sort of the present day simulated state. And then here is the change at 2100. So we see this sort of familiar pattern of oxygen loss at high latitudes, weak increases in oxygen in the tropics. Um, and these, these oxygen patterns in oxygen loss are very tightly coupled to changes in the phosphate distribution. So in a sense, this, you know, we can think about the oxygen loss as a repartitioning of the global ocean nutrient inventory from preformed to remineralized pools, and that is essentially what manifests as a, a depletion of oxygen via um, an increase in AOU. One thing that I just want to point out here is that if we run the model longer, okay, now out to 2300 under sustained 
increases, we see this, this pattern strongly amplified, such that you know, regions in the high tropics are losing you know, order 50% of the oxygen inventory. And, and again, this, um, this uh, enhancement of, of the tropical um, increase. Okay. This is, again, tightly coupled to this repartitioning of the nutrient inventory. So we can look at this kind of in a phase space that's um, delineated by the change in AOU and the change in solubility. And in this phase space, I've drawn contour lines that represent no change in oxygen. And then I've plotted on top of that the, um, the trajectory of all the CMIP-5 mo models starting at 1970. So a model that, that, um, that just moves uh, sort of horizontally in this phase space, oxygen, oxygen loss is entirely driven by solubility. A, mox, a model that moves vertically, oxygen loss is entirely driven by the respiration component or the change in AOU. What we see at the global scale is a very heterogeneous signal, right? The models sort of spread out. And it, the key thing here is that that manifests from very different behavior in the tropics and extratropics. So to an extent, there's, reasonable, there's, there's reinforcing change where um, AOU is changing commensurate with changes in solubility in the extratropics and there's compensating change um, in the tropics, right? So these, these, this, it's this compensation between the changes in AOU and changes in solubility that lead to these slight increases in oxygen in the tropical thermocline in the models. We can then put this in the context of oxygen change as a function of changes in heat content and also add observations to the picture. The top row is showing trends over this period, 1970 to 2014. Here are the same collection of models. This dashed line is the change in oxygen as a function of temperature that one would get from pure solubility driven change. So any departures, uh, you know, an increase in the negative slope relative to that line are indicative of the contribution of the respiration driven component. Right? And so what we see is that the models are clustered here whereas this particular observational construction which is a, from a paper by Takahito and others in, in 2017 shows a much stronger um, depletion of oxygen. So this is consistent with the results that, that, that Andre um, pointed out. But if we move now to, to looking at the sort of the full change over, over, uh, over the next century, what we see again is this, is it, here's the global picture, and we see this sort of regional difference where, you know, there's very little consistency across the models um, in the tropics, but a fairly tight, um, a, a tight grouping um, in the extra tropics. Okay, so I want to go back now to this, um, to this, uh, this internal variability component and, and illustrate a few results um, in, in this context. So the first thing is that in the context of a large ensemble, what we have basically is multiple realizations of the next, uh, of the next uh, several decades. And we can look actually in the diversity of of those realizations to try to understand the role of natural variability in driving signals of change. So what I'm plotting here is 200 meter oxygen trends, and I'm just showing you the North, North Pacific. And this is, this is basically a large ensemble of about 30 members that, um, that simulates oxygen change. And so we see you know, a fair degree of correspondence across these members, but you can pick out some for instance, this one in the center that, you know, over the next 50 years, this is actually 2006 to 20, 2055, so we're already into this period a bit. But, you know, here, this particular ensemble member is, is actually simulating a net decrease in oxygen in the North Pacific over this time, right? So there's an indication that natural variability is playing a strong role. We can add some sort of a formal definition here to this, and that if we basically average across the ensemble, we can derive a metric for the forced component of change. This is the deterministic response of the climate system to the external forcing. We're integrating out the variability by making an average. And so these two plots here are identical. I'm just plotting on this row one, two, I'm plotting two different ensemble members. So after we've computed then the forced component of change, we can subtract that from the total signal, right? And, and and the, to we, the total signal, we can subtract that from the total signal to get this internal variability component. And so what we see in this context here is that, you know, this particular ensemble member, internal variability is driving significant declines in oxygen over the next 50 years, 
Whereas this one, you know, has a very different structure to the pattern, right? And so this is a result of changes in atmospheric circulation that are driving changes in the ventilation patterns, um, producing trends in, in the signal. Okay, and so here then is the diversity of internally, internally varied, internally driven trends across the ensemble, right? And you can see that, you know, internal variability is a big component of, of the signal and something that we need to think about in the context of interpreting observed trends. So, does the internal variability explain the discrepancy in, um, between models and, and, and observations? And I think just, just you know, to deliver the punchline, that the answer is probably no, based on what we see um, in the large ensemble. And I'm, I'm illustrating that here. Now we're looking again at the global scale. Okay? And here is the, the Ito et al. observational estimates of changes in dissolved oxygen concentration over a, over a period of several decades. Here is each of these gray lines is the ensemble, and the and the black line is the on, is the ensemble mean. So suffice it to say that you know if you look at the PDF of trends that are simulated in the ensemble, you get this thing here, and and the observation the observed um, trend estimate with very large uncertainty bars is well outside that ensemble mean. So at the global scale, you know it, it appears to be the case that this ensemble simply cannot represent trends of the strength that are observed, um, that are present in the observed, in the observational reconstruction. What about at a regional scale? Well, we can home in, and this is just sort of one arbitrarily selected region um, in the, in the uh, subtropical North Atlantic. And, you know, this case, in this case, we see the same, same, same set of plots here. We do see in this case that, you know, that the observed trend is within the PDF, but on the, on the, on the margins of the PDF, and so this gives us some sense that, you know, perhaps in this particular region, the, the model is capable of representing trends that are that are consistent with the observations. So this brings up a question in the context of um, understanding these trends, and in particular, we'd like to be able to make statements about attribution. You know, are trends in the ocean being forced by uh, by human-driven warming? And here's a, an attempt to do something like that in a formal sort of time of emergence analysis. And I'm just, in this particular instance, I'm focusing on a region um, off, off the west coast of the United States in the California current. I'm not making any statement here that the model does a great job necessarily in simulating this particular region, but just to illustrate the nature of this problem, what I can do is plot the diversity of realizations from this ensemble. Again, the black line is the ensemble mean. And then I can ask the question, are trends in, these, in this record distinct from the trends we might expect from variability? And the way I do that is I compute <coughs> retrospective trends at, at different points, in, or, you know, successively throughout the ensemble. I compute retrospective trends of different length and then compare them to the PDF of, of, of those trends across the ensemble. And when I reach a signal to noise ratio of about two, I, I, I I'd say the signal has, has emerged. And so this manifests a, as follows. So for 10 year retrospective trends, we get this sort of blue envelope of variability. And, and basically, you know, there's a lot of fluctuation here and sort of a, a general sense that that, that, that spectrum is, is converging, but there's no, we, we can't statistically actually attribute um, a, a, an emergence of the signal with 10 year trends. With 60-year trends, basically we have to get to 60-year trends or so to, to be able to determine a time of emergence. And, and that time of emergence is actually relatively deep you know, into the 2040s, 2050s, based on retrospective trends. So if we do that, that type of analysis globally, what you see is that you know, this is sort of that time of emergence. We, we should see very early emergence you know, in, the, in the high latitude southern ocean with you know, uh, the signal in, in theory should be emerging now. And the tropics, you know, where we see net oxygen increases have a much, have a much longer time scale. I think it's important to point out that, you know, this, provide, this map provides a sense of the, the length of the record necessary to achieve emergence. And, and um, these are fairly long records, right? So this is, poses a challenge to the observational record. Okay, we can think about that. What we, what we just did was sort of think about it at a discrete local level, but we can think about emergence in the context of the spatial patterns that structure, um, that, are, that are associated with different forcing. And the way I'm gonna do that is, is walk you through just 
uh, this kind of the systematics of this kind of analysis. So we've seen this equation before. Here's just our decomposition of the total uh, time evolving spatial pattern into a component associated with natural variability and one associated with the force trend, right? This is the definition of the force trend. Um, we can construct climate anomalies and then we can do um, an EOF decomposition of these climate anomalies into a time varying principal component and a spatial pattern associated with that. And then we can look, we can visualize these EOFs, right? And if we do the, this comparable analysis on a control integration and compare it to the analysis on the ensemble mean, uh, we, we, we can visualize the patterns associated with, characteristic patterns associated with natural variability and those associated with the force trend. And that's what I'm illustrating here. So here are the first four EOFs, the leading EOFs associated with natural variability. And here is the spatial pattern of the force signal. I should mention that I'm, I'm operating now on the 26.5 isopycnal surface. So this analysis is particular to that isopycnal surface, right? So here, here's, this, here's the force signal. So this is the pattern that we might expect climate change to induce in oxygen changes um, on the 26.5 isopycnal surface. It has a fair degree of commonality, unfortunately, to an extent, with one of the leading mode of natural variability um, in, in oxygen on this isopycnal. But we can get more quantitative about this and actually take the, okay, so here's our, here's our decomposition of of, 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 um, of oxygen anomalies, um, we can look then at projecting basically each of the ensemble members onto the, spa onto the spatial pattern associated with the force signal and then compute a metric that is basically the percent of, spa of spatial variance that's attributable to that pattern. Okay. So this is what we get when we do that. Okay. So here's this pattern, spatial, this, here's that spatial pattern and, and then this is now um, the, the, the percent, the accumulation, basically the percent of spatial variance that's attributable to that pattern, right? And so we see this sort of inexorable rise, basically that pattern should be emerging from the noise. So if we had ubiquitous observations, we should be able to then think about the covariance of those observations to draw out a signal in a, in a fairly powerful way. Okay, I just want to mention that there's other forced signals, and in particular this is um, this is just illustrating the effects of volcanoes on the system. And we see very punctuated effects, for instance, in the air-sea flux of oxygen and changes, um, here are the volcanoes, changes in, in, in the interior oxygen distribution um, associated with volcanoes. Okay, for the final just few minutes of the talk, I want to talk about initialized prediction. And I'm going to have to move fast to cover this. But this is the idea that we can actually basically initialize a model and um, be able to predict the evolution uh, to the extent that the, that initialization is remembered by the system. Operationally, the way we do this is we take an ocean ice, um, ocean ice system, basically set the ocean and sea ice state to be consistent to the best of our ability with observations, and then put those um, ocean states into the coupled model um, and integrate forward in time. And this is sort of a sausage-making enterprise in that there's a lot of things that don't work optimally. And this is just to illustrate that. This is a, a time series of heat content in the North Atlantic subpolar gyre. All these sort of flagella are the ensemble mean of forecast distributions. And what, what basically happens is that the coupled model is unhappy with the initialized state and so starts drifting like crazy. But if you apply a drift correction procedure, what you can do is sort of recover the signal there and, and then begin to evaluate the predictive capacity. So what does that look like for oxygen? Well, this is again on the 26.5 isopycnal surface. What we see, I'm what I'm plotting here are anomaly um, correlations, basically a, a skill score for the model. And the top row just shows the raw skill score. So if we look at oxygen in the thermocline, basically you know, at a one year lead, all the way out in some cases to a near decadal lead, we have high skill in predicting um, oxygen anomalies in the thermocline. That skill is robust. Um, it's elevated over just a persistence metric, and it's elevated over an uninitialized some, an ensemble which re retains predictive skill simply um, from the force So what attributes, what, what, what types of mechanisms might engender predictability? 
We get a hint of, of what might be at play here by just looking at spice. So this is the salinity on the same isopycnal surface. We see very similar structure in the predictive skill in spice. So just to wrap up here, here's a final example then of sort of um, the mechanisms that, that might be at play. This is a time series detrended of oxygen anomalies at Ocean Station Papa. The, um, the red line is, is the observations, and the black line is a, is a Heimkast integration, which actually simulates this variability very well, surprisingly well. Um, and here, here's sort of an analysis that, um, that illustrates, uh, this is work by Daoshan Sun and Taki Ito um, on this problem. Here's an analysis that illustrates some of the mechanisms of the play. So we're looking at lag correlations here in the North Pacific between two boxes. If we look at um, the oxygen time series in black, at Ocean Station Papa, and a time series of oxygen variability in the Kuroshio extension region, we see this very tight um, correspondence at about a four-year lag. Right? So basically what's happening here is that anomalies are generated in the subarctic North Pacific, and they're transported by the gyre flow and attenuated, um, such that if you're, if you're wading downstream, you can basically, or if you're, predict, if you're trying to predict oxygen downstream, you can, you can use, um, you know, the, the oxygen four years ago uh, uh, upstream as, as a metric. Okay. And I don't have time to go into this in detail, but suffice it to say you can, you can do this in a more general way um, through a technique called a, a linear inverse model um, that is basically, you know, uses a matrix that encapsulates the dynamics of the system built on, um, built on the covariance matrices um, that, that enables you to, to do to do this sort of in a general sense. And this is the prediction then at Ocean Station Papa. Here are the, the red lines are the, are the data that we've seen. And um, there's different sort of varieties of the limb framework used to predict, um, to predict that oxygen variability, right? So um, that, the, the results here I think are somewhat promising. Okay, so just to summarize, um, the force changes are, are um, the force changes are a result of this combined respiration and solubility effect. Most, mostly respiration. The models tend to agree to, to leading order in the, in the extratropics, but disagree in the tropics. Um, models are significantly underestimating the respiration-driven component. Um, natural variability is really important, you know, in the context of thinking about variability and change. And we are developing the capacity to actually predict oxygen on interannual to decadal timescales. Okay, that'll take questions. Well, uh, Matt, I'll start with a question. Sorry. Um, what about all the variability that's not in a model? How do you incorporate that into a time of emergence? Um, the short answer is we don't. And, um, well, it's, so, you know, we know, for instance, that um, I'm going the wrong direction. Yeah, so, so for instance, this is, the black line here is a reconstruction of oxygen fluxes, and, and just focus on the top left. The blue line is a reconstruction, or is our, our simulated oxygen fluxes, and the variability in this case is about 50% too low, right? So we know the models both don't capture the response correctly, moreover, the variability is weak. So because time of emergence is a ratio between the sig those two things, it's actually unclear how that, you know, how the reduced variability and the reduced sensitivity of the force trend might impact the time of emergence, right? But the variability is absolutely too weak. Do you need more data to fix this or do you need better resolution? And don't um, say both. <laughs> I mean, the question, the, the answer is obvious, right? It's both. But, um, you know, I think you got to pick your problem, right? So, you know, I think some of the issues in the tropical thermocline oxygen problem are definitely resolution related, right? We have OMZs that are vastly too extensive, and indications are that we're just not accurately representing the physical processes that mediate ventilation. 
sorry. Um, so it, you don't distinguish between um, solubility and changes in circulation, whereas the, the speaker before you, you know, there was changes in solubility mediated by temperature, changes in circulation, and changes in AOU. So um, could you expand on that? So I think of changes as a, changes, I think of it as changes in solubility and changes in AOU or respiration. And changes in AOU manifest from changes in respiration or changes and or changes in circulation, right? So you can actually do that formal decomposition. And so if you're making water younger, the path integral of respiration is lower, even if respiration is held constant. So it's not, there's no inconsistency there. Hey Matt, nice talk. Um, I think in both of the talks, though, there was a, there's a question I have about gas exchange. There's a sort of assumption that AOU and, and, um, and phosphate by themselves give you the answer, right? Whereas, in fact, we know that there could be large, we, we know that in the modern models, there's a significant failure to express both AOU and, um, and the, the, the biological pump because of gas exchange. Right. And so do you think that that might be more important in variability or do you... I'm not sure I follow your question. The, 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 the extent to which many of these regions which, have, which are ventilation regions have deep mixed layers and so the oxygen isn't in fact equilibrated. So that disequilibrium term is sometimes neglected here. Oh, yes. And I, I yeah. wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Um, yeah, I haven't thought a lot about that. Um, so maybe we could talk offline. All right, let's thank Matt one last time.